introduce next um, Terry Harrison, who is the secretary from one of the Kent Coalfields from the Bex Hanger NUM. So, Terry. Thank you. What's up there? Yeah, make yourself comfortable. The revolution will start in approximately hours' time. Uh, I'm going to have a bit of a ramble today. Actually, I shouldn't be here today. Be, uh, I've had a difficult 12 months, uh, but due to the National Health Service, uh, they made me fit enough to come here uh, and be with you today. And if they think up the good work, work, I might be here next year too. But during that period, I met your brothers, your sisters, your mothers, your fathers, undergoing chemotherapy. We're having to queue for the stuff to come from the laboratories because there's so much many of us and there's so many treatments that's available but i only mention this in the side uh, because i'm getting tired of the incessant public and media attacks on our national health service and our staff <laughs> i know you have a problem i mean how could you have a problem when there's millions of us going into hospitals and some of us it's just not possible for us to come out of there alive. The main factor being we're living too long. I mean, it's not a bad thing to go by. And the other ramble I wanted to do was the fact that our relationship with Brighton and uh, the Kent miners go back a further than 30, year, 30 years. The first time the Kent miners came here, was the first national strike at the NUM in 1972. And they went to pick it at Shoreham Harbour. I think it was A and B uh, power station down then. Uh, and then perhaps Johnny Collard uh, and lads like that was put up uh, in local uh, places and, and they picked it in that harbour. And it was as left at that time, I think, uh, and the NUS. And of course, the success of the 72 one was this uh, trade union movement was solid. Uh, and Jack Jones, I just forget the AUEW uh, president, uh, they did fight through the TUC to get a recognition of miners' picket lines. And so as long as we appeared on the bank to stop a train and the picket line stopped there, the train did. And it was the same down at Shoreham Harbour. And of course, the Labour Club, they also accommodated Arnold Moyle. They stopped there, kind of camping within the Labour Cup uh, for the duration of that strike. I suppose one of the other things was a bit of a character that we had was chairman of Betsanger was John Moyle, who came down here and uh, a scout lot. He did come out of Shoreham Harbour and he managed to jump on the back of it uh, and he was thrust in bags of coal all the way down the esplanade. <laughs> and he got into a bit of a mess and the press picked up on it just as he decided that he was in a bit of a mess. He went into the local laundry, stripped off, chucked it in the washer, waited it for dry and got dressed again and the local press caught up with that. <laughs> My task in 72 was the conduct of pickets in the London area and I bought two of the uh, uh, posters that we used during that strike. Uh, it was a short, sharp strike, six or seven weeks, uh, followed by an agreement in Downing Street, and the strike was successful. And I drank, can you believe it, with Joe Gormley, the president of the NUM then, the next morning, who was very satisfied about the fact that he had led the first successful national strike. And so that was my, my recollection of the 72 uh, and then there was the 74 strike. Uh, but uh, we kind of drifted into a confrontation with Thatcher. Uh, we came out in 82 and was successful, uh, but she was cleverer than us in that uh, she just allowed an agreement to be made <clears throat> and we kind of wondered into the 84 strike. And 
the 84 strike, I suppose, uh, was the de most demanding strike that could have been placed on the backs of any uh, men and women. And I was speaking to some Swedish reporters earlier uh, about, uh, you know, the commitment that was made. Uh, I mean, it's all right leading people into strike, but if you don't, if you haven't got your army there, you're going nowhere. And that army was solid throughout over 12 months of that strike. And we had our successes from the point of view of organisation in that we had our soup kitchens. You could hardly call them soup kitchens. Our women were producing substantial meals uh, for uh, our uh, families. Uh, and they maintained that. And it was done mainly by a kind of a reawakening, if I could put it that way, uh, that uh, the feminist movement had been slumbering after the equal pay claim uh, of, uh, or equal pay legislation um, of, come on, somebody remind me, Barbara. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to see. Uh, you're still with me because names are beginning to slip. Uh, but uh, they really picked up the cudgel. And in many ways, they ran in front of the mind as far as organisation was concerned. And uh, I have said to Liz, as I've said to many of her colleagues, uh, without that, without that in my branch, I doubt if we could have maintained that struggle uh, in the way that we did. Uh, it was difficult, it was hard, and it was treacherous in that the forces that was flung against us was organised. And I'm talking about organised from the point of view of the judiciary especially, going back down to local magistrates and going back down to the police, where it was systematic in picking up minors, carting them off, incarcerating them in cells, not arraigning them in front of the magistrate in over 24 hours, and then putting injunctions against them returning to the picket lines. But notwithstanding that, the humour, certainly within my branch, and I can only talk about my branch in many ways, was maintained, and their solidarity was maintained, and I couldn't have been more proud. But having said that, I have to say to Gary and Liz, that as your secretary, it was never my intention that there would be any physical suffering or any incarceration of mine. It's just ironic that I finished up with the biggest portion of miners in prison and the biggest group of miners sacked of which I was uh, one of them. I'm pleased to tell you that uh, the last Labour government, call them what you will, at least set the bill as far as the sap miners con was concerned and we did get uh, five years in hand pensions uh, put into the pot. That's as long as we claimed it within three, three months. Very much in like, uh, you know, claiming for unfair dismissal, uh, etc. So I was pleased uh, that that had happened and then we had uh, coal health claims. But, the other people I want to talk about is yourself. 84, we came down here and we put on a big demonstration, you may remember, at the TUC Congress. We marched down from the park and we had a fraternity and egalitarian in front of us as we marched in this way toward TUC Congress. And I suppose one of the sad things was to compare what had happened in the 72-74 strike and what happened in the 84-85 strike. We were not able to get the solidarity of the trade union movement that would enable us to deliver a victory right across the board. Because remember that coming up behind us was the post office workers and whopping and what had gone before us was Grunwick that we'd also forgotten about. And so I was pleased uh, about uh, those situations. Now, today is International Women's Day and it's also Sarah's Law. 
And as a male, I'm now 83, I remember particularly the violence that could be found within working class families. Uh, and that doesn't exclude my own. And so Sarah's law, to think of this silent suffering that has been going on within our communities uh, is nearly, for me, unbearable. And it's no different with this genital mutilation. One finds it difficult to contemplate our political movement has not been able to deliver better. Uh, I shall be less than five minutes. Uh, but there are other things happening within our communities. And it's these that I wanted to ramble on about rather than what happened to us 30 years ago. I can only say that 30 years off, our situation in Kent is different from those in the northern coal fields. In the northern coal fields, there is no other reason for that pit village being there than it needed a pit. And if it didn't have a pit, it needed to diversify. And the Kent miners had argued for many, many years within the nationalised industry that we should be allowed to diversify and put our minds onto other things that we could do. So my attitude uh, is different again from those in the northern coal field, in that the men of Kent did find other ways and means of making a living. But one of the things that the local uh, employers found out was that the calibre of those miners, I don't think they, I don't know whether they thought we were illiterate uh, workers toiling down uh, under the earth, but they got a pleasant shock to find that uh, they was quite an enlightened workforce to recruit from. So the other problem for me was listening to a NUM official up in the northeast waxing lyrical about a police band being uh, asked to play in the Durham Miners Gala. And for the life of me, I was thinking, well, Darren, Daniel, Daniel Barrenboy with it, had been taking Jews and Arabs and Palestinians and playing in an orchestra, and we're bothered about a police band playing at one of our festivals. But what really cleansed it for me was watching Aston Villa play Newcastle. It was bad enough that we lost 1-0. But when I saw footballers with Wonga, Wonga, Wonga spread across their chests and spread across the stadium, then that becomes a bitter pill to swallow. And I'll leave you with another memory then that I have. Especially uh, for our musicians. Um, we used to have as our anthem, uh, a song, an American song, and it was uh, Union Miners stand together, do not hear the owner's tale, keep your hands upon your wages and you rise upon the scale. But another memory was, must have been 56, 57. The South Wales miners, with their choirs, had a great affinity with music, and they struggled to get Paul Robeson his passport, and eventually they did. And I went to a funeral, it was either Arthur Orners or it was Ali Pollock's. And uh, I looked back at, uh, through the doors, and coming through these doors was the most enormous man I've ever seen. It was Paul Robeson. But the memory that he left me with was he sang, I dreamt I saw Joe last night, alive as you and me, said I to Joe, you're ten years dead, I never died, said he, from Salt Lake City up to Maine, in every mine and mill, where working class defend their rights, that's where you'll find Joe And that's where you'll also find the Kent Miner.
Thank you very much, Terry. There were a